Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL course on Rural Water Resource Management, week 4, lecture 1. Let's do the recap for week 3 and then we'll see how it is linked to week 4. In the week 3 and also week 2, we looked at introducing the hydrological cycle. We also discussed key parameters. We identified 6 parameters for the Rural Water Resource Management which are very important. Of that, three were discussed in week two, and in the last week, we discussed surface water structures uh, and what constitutes surface water storage, soil moisture, and groundwater. Slowly, we understood that uh, of the resources for small scale and rural livelihood options, uh, we do need better groundwater management. So somewhere there has been a higher focus on groundwater use in agriculture. Uh, so the idea for our course moving on is to have a couple of more lectures more focused on groundwater hydrology. So this would help, especially in the coming seasons with climate change extremes, to manage water in a better pace because you need to understand where to store water and also the demand and supply for these resources and in especially groundwater which is more complex in nature so with this let's jump into week four so what we'll be looking at in week four is we will be defining the groundwater hydrology uh, what constitutes the hydrology for groundwater what are the key factors where water is stored and uh, how to uh, understand in storing these waters using natural and artificial means. So to introduce, uh, we know the overall hydrology. Uh, we know how much water is coming in. Let's do a quick uh, volume related hydrological estimate. So uh, around 284,000 kilometer cube precipitation. This is just an example. So is falling on the uh, planet in this particular area, study area. Uh, and then uh, there's a division of uh, preservation in different forms. This could be in, in rain, snow, et cetera, et cetera. So if you add all of them, it would come more or less to your total water evaporated and how much is condensed and sequestered. So uh, only some part is uh, given as runoff and there's some direct precipitation which directly falls on oceans, but most importantly, water infiltrates, okay? So evaporation happens from open surfaces, uh, but then water infiltrates and then gives back to some open sources, etc. So what is groundwater hydrology? The study that focuses more on the groundward movement of water uh, and or deeper movement of water under the Earth's crust is called groundwater hydrology. So the factors are the same for the overall hydrology also. So atmospheric precipitation infiltrates. So it's not that it has a different source of water. The precipitation is the source for all the water. Okay? And the precipitation is from the atmosphere. It could be from uh, rainfall, it could be from snowfall, uh, or any other uh, me methods that I've given earlier. So the water infiltrates into the ground uh, through gravity. And then you have surface water that becomes trapped in the pore space of sediments uh, during the deposition in lakes, streams, and especially oceans, which means so when water is moving, sometimes it can get trapped. Okay? So for example, a river is flowing and suddenly sediments fall on it and sediments keep on piling like a landslide, uh, movement of plates, earthquake, tectonic, etc. So what you see is if suddenly there is a locking of water, then water gets stored underneath. Okay, so that is water which is stored in the pore spaces of sediments and or rocks uh, during the deposition lakes, streams, especially oceans are constitute for the groundwater. So either way, uh, we will also get into where it gets stored. 
uh, especially in uh, sediments and rocks. Water degas from cooling magma. So under the ground, there are magmas which flow, which is molten material, very hot material. So when it flows, uh, sometimes uh, water is degassed, okay, and that gets stored under the ground uh, in pockets and or in sediment pores, and that also constitutes your groundwater. So there are groundwater uh, sources that come from different uh, parts, but most importantly, it's the precipitation. The precipitation converts into surface runoff, and the surface runoff gets stored into the water uh, because of uh, your piling up of sediments or also lakes moving underground and then water gets locked. So uh, the surface water which is being transported sometimes gets stuck and uh, under the ground and because of the position and that actually constitutes your groundwater. Theory of groundwater flow, soils, rocks and sediments in the subsurface consist of matrix of solid mineral grains and pore spaces. So we have seen this earlier also, any material you have in the surface, subsurface would contain sediments, so soil, rocks, etc. but with pore spaces, which is a space that is empty, not solid, and that space can be filled up with air or water. So that gives the name of porous soil, porous soil or soil media. So now water has a storage unit to go and fill itself. So when water is flowing, it is looking for where can it go and settle or continue moving from high potential to low potential and the void spaces uh, are a perfect unit. So the pore spaces get filled up with water. You could see how different uh, pore spaces are available in the material. Each one is a different material. And sometimes pore spaces are in the solid material, like your sponge. Your sponge you use to clean uh, is uh, a, a material, but inside you have pores, like cheese. Cheese might have pores inside. So those kind of things uh, can store water in between and also inside the solid. And, but mostly the solids are solid, so water cannot go in. Uh, some solids have cracks, so the cracks can also take water and constitute groundwater. You have a mixture of these bigger and smaller uh, sediment sizes in the soil medium uh, or also water in and out of your soil medium and the fractures in different formats. So all these would give uh, a potential place for water to store and once enough water is stored and connections are made, it starts to flow. So starting point for characteristic fluid flow. So why is it called a fluid? because in these pore spaces, water can be mixed with air. So that medium, that phase is called fluid phase. So fluid flow through porous media is given by Darcy's law. There are only two laws that most widely used for groundwater studies. One is the Darcy's law, the other one is the Richardson uh, law. But uh, of these two, Darcy's law is uh, very simple, uh, very effective, and has been used widely across the world. Let's now look at a focused groundwater hydrology diagram from model. In the earlier hydrological cycle, we looked at the overall hydrological cycle. Right now, we will be looking at the groundwater hydrological cycle. As with all cycles, we have to identify what is the source uh, for the groundwater. And as I said, precipitation is the source. So precipitation occurs on the surface. Until then, it's a normal hydrology, right? So it's not groundwater hydrology. But then when water starts to infiltrate, then the first soil material, which does not have soil moisture, is called the unsaturated zone. And that is where water moves in because there is space. Unsaturated means not enough water, not fully occupied with water. So there is a space where water can enter. So water first enters into that. And then it hits another soil profile or a material where it is saturated with groundwater. It could be a rock material, it could be your soil material. So you can come down and you could see that water moves down further because of uh, the higher potential to lower potential, gravity, et cetera, et cetera. So water is getting recharged into this and establishes a groundwater table, which is a dashed line. 
So now you have water precipitation coming in through infiltration. The first step, precipitation is getting into the surface through infiltration. And once it gets into the unsaturated zone, groundwater recharge happens. You are recharging the groundwater through precipitation. And then a healthy water table is formed. Okay. Sometimes your water would come back up into the surface, which is called your subsurface flow. And uh, most importantly, the water can come at the end point, which is your ocean, streams, rivers, etc. right here. Uh, and that is your groundwater discharge or base flow contribution. So if you look at the groundwater part alone, there are a lot of complex dynamics. Uh, on the top, what would happen is precipitation can also get into your runoff and get into the streams as overland flow, channel flow. And along the stream also, there can be some recharge. So not only on the surface, but along the rivers also, there can be some recharge. Similarly, at the stream level also, water can come from groundwater into the stream. Why? Because your streams are the lowest depression. So when it is low and groundwater it is a higher potential, groundwater will flow from high to low. Okay? So that is what is happening in this arrow marks. It is coming, but once it sees a, a lower potential, water would move in. And evaporate transpiration picks it up to complete the overall hydrological cycle. So you could see here that two components from the overall hydrological cycle, which is precipitation and evapotranspiration, are also in the groundwater cycle, but with more complex components under the ground. So groundwater is mostly under the ground. The sources and losses can be above the ground. So once the water comes up, if it is evapotranspiration is taking place, then it is a loss to the system. So the flow lines are given by these and equal potential lines are equal head, equal potential. So which means water won't flow from one point to another point, but along those lines, because the potential is equal. Only when there is a potential difference, a potential gradient, you could see water moving, okay? So for example, you have two water levels at the same level, which is equal potential. Why would the water move? Would it move from A to B? No. Only when A is higher, it will move from A to B, or if A is lower, water will move from B to A. So if A and B are at the same level, water will not move. Friesen Cherry has also given a flow chart kind of a systems view for hydrology for groundwater. Let's look at it uh, in detail. So you start as a source, as a precipitation. The precipitation enters. And uh, now you have to visualize that you are the water. Okay, so you have the water coming from the clouds. First, what will you see? You will see, you're from the clouds, you're coming down, you will see trees because trees are at a higher elevation above the ground, right? So, so you will see trees. So once the trees you hit, you have interception. So the leaves and the branches might be, so for example, these are, this is the branch and the leaves and your water would hit and intercept. Some water is lost. Okay, so, and some water can be stored on the leaves. So that is interception, interception storage. But then what is the use of the water? Water will just stay on the leaf as wet and then dry off. It's the same like your car. Water can fall on the car. What will happen? Is it going to go inside the car? No, it will slowly evaporate. So that evaporation happens here, not transpiration, but evaporation. Uh, understand that when we talk about evapotranspiration term, sometimes it might be only evaporation, but to keep it simple and collect it, the two terms are combined together. So don't ask tomorrow, tomorrow sir, you said uh, evapotranspiration, but interception cannot be transpiration. True, it is only evaporation, but it contributes to the evapotranspiration total volume. Okay. Moving on, so there is some water that goes as through fall. Now visualize yourself again. If your trees do not capture, do not intercept, intercept your water, then what happens? You go through. So that is called through fall. So you're falling down, falling down and touching the surface. So right here, you would have a surface which is missing here, but that is understandable, right? So you through fall, then you have a surface. Here is the land surface. What happens in the land surface? part of the water, now visualize yourself, you hit the land and you start to move laterally as overland flow. Because that is much easier to go rather than going into the ground because you have a solid. 
Okay, so while your overland flow is occurring, some water is converted, your precipitation water is converted into channel storage. Where will the water flow? All the water around the ground will flow and find a low depression and it will go through that depression and that is your channel storage, river, stream, etc, etc. So all the water would come down and go into the channel storage and then goes as runoff. Okay, so I'm closing this loop now. So what is remaining is infiltration. So while this overland flow is happening, some water droplets which hit the ground and slowly know that because of instead of going overland flow, I'll go inside because of gravity, it moves slowly down. And that first unit of storage it visualizes is, it uh, seizes your unsaturated soil moisture storage. So there are two storage units. One is unsaturated and then a saturated. So the unsaturated has less water. So water can move into the soil and go inside and get stored. So some water is stored, but some is taken by plants. So what would happen? Exactly. It will go as transpiration. So the evapotranspiration term now gets more input from transpiration. Okay. There is some soil evaporation also, which comes through this. Good. So now what happens to the water that is not taken by plants? Gravity is still pulling it down, right? So it will go further down. What is below the root zone? What is below your unsaturated? It is a saturated water storage unit. So you have now two compartments. One compartment is unsaturated. Water goes in, saturates it, but still because of gravity uh, and uh, force of pulling of water, it comes down. Soil wants water. Right? So when it comes down, the saturated zone is there where fully water is there so you can still add water where water then would move laterally because vertically it cannot move there is a bedrock so that is what is happening some water is still taken by trees so even the deep groundwater storage you could have transpiration because your tree zone uh, has a better and higher deeper root uh, than your plants plants might go up to a couple of meters but your um, uh, trees can go much further. Ex examples are pine uh, and cactus, those kind of trees would have extensive networks of roots. But there are another channel. So what happens to some of the unsaturated flow? It goes as interflow. As I said, some of the water which goes into the soil can come up back out. So when it comes back out, it becomes interflow, goes to the rivers, streams, and runoff. So it closes the loop in that direction. What happens to the groundwater that is down in the deep aquifer? In the deep aquifer or the saturated zone, water is full now. Now you have a full bucket. What does happen? It overflows, right? When it overflows, it cannot pick a direction uh, which it likes, but it has to follow the physics, which is high potential to low potential. So it will follow the gradient, the slope gradient or the land gradient and go towards that side. And it will go through as base flow because it will eventually, the deep aquifer will eventually go and join the rivers, ocean, lakes. Uh, and that part where it comes is downward movement through the downward channels and into the river is called your base flow. Then it goes back to your channel storage and runoff. So the runoff or discharge in the river can have multiple inputs. One is your overland flow, the water hits and comes straight. Some goes as interflow, which comes into the ground and then comes back out. And then the base flow, which water goes deeper into the aquifer, stays there for some time and then comes out. So if you're looking at a flood protection, let's say, and you know that these are very, very small components, uh, but here the runoff is too much. Where would you put infrastructure to reduce the peak? You would put it in the base flow. So which means you would put more water in the groundwater storage unit and then your base flow would come later into the runoff. Thereby, the precipitation and runoff are not same, but at the same time, but first precipitation happens and after two, three months, your base flow gives water to the runoff, thereby slowing down the runoff, thereby bringing down the peak. This is the interesting part uh, in uh, groundwater hydrology and the Ganges water machine which I told, works on this. They pump this part out so that water can go through, get stored, 
and later, later in the season, non-monsoon season, it fills up and then the base flow happens, runoff happens. Changes in groundwater with depth in Earth's crust. This is an important diagram where you see water recharges vertically down. And as I said, this is your bedrock kind of area where not much water is there. So what does water see? When a water molecule moves down, it finds a surface waters where there's less, uh, you know, uh, sediments and uh, stones. So everything is water in the surface water, right? Uh, then underneath it, right underneath it, you have the sediment soil right here also, where you have big, big pore spaces. The volume of the space between the solid is big, so water can store. Now let's go down a little bit further. If you go down a couple more layers where the root zone is, where plants take up water, this size of the empty space is now less. So it's less volume of water comes in. So just look visually, the first uh, image has more solid volume uh, and also more water volume. Come to the next image, the solid volume is bigger, much, much bigger than the wa water volume. Okay. Then if we go down further, now we're moving down vertically down. If we go down further, what you could see is very, very less amount of space for water to be stored and more structured soil because the soil is not weathered. So if you go up here, the soil is fully weathered less weathered and very, very less weather. And here's almost not much weather there. So well, it's not breaking up, soil is not breaking up. Only when it breaks up, you have spaces for water. So when you go down further, you have less water. And then when you go down to the bedrock kind of region, extremely low porosity, extremely low amount of uh, space for air or volume uh, of water to be stored. So very small amounts of water is stored. So water goes to the first phase, then slowly goes down, and then the second phase, which is uh, more consolidated rocks, you don't have much space. So now here's the concern. Just look at the depth, zero to 15 kilometers only. So here's the doubt. When you start as a farmer and put your wells here, a farmer or an urban settlement in your house, you're putting a well and accessing this water, you're fine because water space is there. You pull the water, water can come in. Okay, well and good. But when you go further and further down, you're accessing very less amount of water. When you put the well down, you'll see a lot of water. So you should not be fooled saying, oh, I'm seeing a lot of water, water will come in. No, it's because the water has been stored in a longer period. But once you take the water out, it takes another 10, five years to, for the water to come in. So you're at loss. And this is the complexity of groundwater hydrology. With increasing depth in the Earth's crust, porosity decreases. The porosity is the term that gives you the space for air and water inside the soil profile, okay? So that decreases, so groundwater abundances decreases. So as you move vertically down, as the depth increases, it comes very less space for groundwater. Groundwater becomes more saline because water is staying in close approximation with the rock for a long time. I did use this word that these waters can be you pump it, it recharges, pump it, recharges. But these two layers, if you pump it, it takes a long time for the water to recharge because water has been staying there for a long, long time. So when water is staying there for a long time with the rock, it does get some of the nutrients from the rock. It gets some signatures from the rock. And what does it become? It becomes saline. Saline means not salty alone, but rock's salt comes in. For example, if you go to some villages, uh, they'll say the water is sweet. Groundwater is sweet. It's not sweet because of sugar or, or anything else. That material, that solid that has been in that uh, area uh, has the tendency of sweet. The salt has a sweet thing, taste. Not all salts. When we say salts for rocks, it's not all saline, which means not salty that you put in your food. Uh, this is a different salt. So uh, the salt content can be different taste. It could be pungent. It can smell differently. Uh, so understood, understand that salt means different in different depths also and materials also. So because the water is staying there for a long time, it gets saline. 
So it is very important to understand salinity. Moving on, let's look at a river alone and see how groundwater can come in or go out of the system. So when there is a river flowing and the river is flowing at a lower potential compared to a high potential of groundwater, groundwater will flow from high potential to low potential. In other terms, the groundwater feeds the river. We call it as feeding the river. And the river, I am the river, I am a gaining stream, gaining river, because I gain water from the groundwater. Let's take a desert. Look at the trees. It's very clear that one is more uh, lush green trees, etc., whereas the other one is a deserted thing. In a deserted thing, your stream is there. But your groundwater table is much, much lower because there's less rainfall to recharge the groundwater. And so the groundwater table, the groundwater level is at a much, much uh, lower depth compared to the other regions. And suddenly when there's rainfall, there is a river flowing. What would happen? Your river would, instead of gain water from groundwater, it would give water to the groundwater. Same principle. Water moves from high potential to low potential. So in this diagram, in diagram B, your high potential is the stream or river, and it will give water. It has to give water to the groundwater. So that is where some people try to line in cement using cement and other materials like plastic, tarp, etc., along these channels so that in a dry area, so that water, when it goes, it doesn't get lost down, but it has to go through the farmer. And think about it, it is more energy consuming to take this water up rather than this water because it, it has a very less depth. So you can easily pump it up, but this one would require a couple of uh, very strong uh, pumps to get the water. And also the water volume is not enough. So driving message here is a stream can be a gaining stream. I can be a gaining stream if I get water uh, from the groundwater. A stream can be a losing stream when it gives water to the water table or groundwater. And it depends on where you are and what is the geology, uh, how the porous system is. But most importantly, it is driven by your water potential. Is your stream at a higher potential compared to the groundwater? Then the water is being released. We also looked at the base flow hydrograph. I have to revisit it here so that we understand it once more that discharge versus time is a hydrograph. And how do we know the different components? So suddenly when there is a big rainfall, your discharge picks up. The water level, the water flow uh, in the stream picks up, okay, meter cube per second, for example. It picks up and that is called the rising limb where the rainfall is occurring. Then after some days, it comes down as, a, after it attains the peak, it comes down as a losing uh, limb. So this is called the losing limb of the hydrograph where water uh, is being released much, much lesser, runoff comes in much lesser compared to the previous phase. And then it comes down. When there's no rainfall, if you see uh, water flowing, that is because of base flow, the groundwater, which goes in and comes back out into the streams. So here, how do you separate it? By elongating your base flow line before the rainfall, just elongate it and then it will come to the peak. So draw a line to the peak because after the peak, there is a switch of your hydrograph. So same way you have to switch back to the line of the hydrograph and that will give you the base flow component. Now I know the discharge comes down during a rainfall. The discharge in the base flow comes down during the rainfall, why? Because when your rainfall is occurring, your level in the stream goes up so water will flow from high potential to low potential. So the base flow contribution, the base flow giving into the stream is much less. So we stop, we come down, okay? It doesn't go to zero, but it comes down. And then after the rainfall withdraws and after the concentration is attained, time of concentration or your uh, runoff is attained, the peak is attained, the limb comes down. So you have a recession limb. In the recession limb, what happens is your water comes down very slowly, but your base flow now picks up because now your base flow, your groundwater is at a higher potential than the stream. So water would be given from your groundwater component to the river. And that is what is happening uh, and elongating to a couple of more days. So you see beautifully that base flow comes down, hits the peak, 
And after the peak, there's a switch in your hydrograph. Same way, there's a switch in your base flow and then hits that line. So after this, everything is also base flow. Before this is also base flow. So we have looked at how to take a hydrograph and uh, dissect it into uh, different components. Most importantly, understand how to estimate the base flow. We also looked at the hydrological components uh, for groundwater. Uh, most importantly, infiltration, unsaturated zone, saturated zone. In the next class, we will also look in more details for groundwater hydrology. We'll see you there. Thank you.